Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So for tonight, inshallah, the focus verses are from Surah Al-Ahzab. We have them up here. Uh, we just finished reading these verses, uh, verses 10 and 11. And I want to reflect on an incident from the seerah and try to tie it together for the beginning of the last 10 nights by making a couple of points. Surat al-Ahzab, as you know, takes its name from the confederation, the confederates, the battle of al-Ahzab. Al-Ahzab means the different groups that have leagued together. And this was in the year five of Hijra, after the Prophet ﷺ migrated to al Madinah, And the various Arab tribes leagued together to try to wipe out Islam uh, once and for all. And they lay siege to al Madinah, And this was probably, at least ranks up there, as one of the most difficult times for the Muslim community one of the points of greatest danger and greatest fear. And we can see that in verse 10 and verse 11, where the Quran is talking about the siege that was around al Madinah, And it was a time of starvation. It was a time of tremendous difficulty uh, when the Muslims were trying to defend al Madinah from the Arab tribes that had leagued together about 10 to 12,000 soldiers against a very small army of believers defending uh, al Madina. And they did that by digging a trench so that the soldiers couldn't cross over and enter al Madina. <coughs> and then they had to guard this trench. And so this battle is also sometimes known as the Battle of Al Khandaq or the trench, as well as Al Ahzab. And the Quran is saying, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إذ جاءوكم من فوقكم ومن أسفل منكم وإذ زغت الأبصار وبلغت القلوب الحناجر وتظنون بالله الظنون That they came upon you from above you and from below you. These are all of the soldiers that had come from all sides to wipe out the Muslims. وإذ زغت الأبصار and when your eyes were flitting about, your vision grew dim because people are so afraid, they're just looking all around from panic. And the hearts come up to the throats. You know that feeling when you're panicked and so afraid that you feel that your heart is in your throat? And the most conflicting thoughts about God, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started passing through your mind. Is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala true? Are we really going to uh, be able to be victorious? Are we going to survive? And even the, even the true believers were severely shaken. And so the Quran is saying in the next verse, That there and then the believers were severely tried and they were shaken with a severe shock. And this isn't talking about the hypocrites or the unbelievers. These are the believers. And they were shaken to this degree by this severe trial. So this is a time when in an ordinary nation, the commander in chief steps in and makes decisions. You know, martial law is imposed and you just, you know, you follow what the leader says and so forth. And at this juncture, the Prophet وسلم, through a brilliant backdoor diplomacy maneuver, negotiated with the leader of the biggest tribe that was laying siege to al Madina. They were called al Ghatafan. And the tribe of Ghatafan had 4,000 of the 10,000 soldiers. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, through a secret diplomatic channel, was able to negotiate with them a deal that they would leave in exchange for getting the dates from the palm trees of al Madina, one third of those dates for the coming year. And this move would have broken the siege, would have broken the back of the confederation and solved the problem. So they negotiate this deal and they're ready to ratify it. And then the Prophet, peace be upon him, says to them that I now have to go back and talk it over with my people that he cannot just make the decision single-handedly. He has to get the agreement and the consensus of his people. So he calls Sa'd ibn Ubadah and Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, 
the heads of the two largest tribes in Al Madinah, the Khazraj and the Aus, and he tells them that this is the deal that he has struck. What do you think? And so they ask him, Prophet of Allah, is this revelation? If this has been revealed to you, then we obey. He says, no, it's not revelation, it's stratagem of war. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. And then they say, Prophet of Allah, is this your strong personal desire? If this is what you desire, then we will comply. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, no, this is just my strategy. This is what I think is the way to solve the problem. And they said, in that case, if it is not revelation, and if it is not your strong personal desire that you are asking us to obey, then we have nothing for them except the sword. We are not going to give them any dates. We're not going to give them anything. The only thing we have for them is the sword. So the Prophet went back to the Ghatafan and told them, I'm sorry, the deal is off. We have no deal. And the siege then continued for quite a while until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, solved the problem for the believers and a strong wind came and, and it was bitter cold and they were not able to cross into Al-Madinah and finally they gave up, dissension broke out among their ranks and, and they gave up the siege and left. But the point I want to make here is that especially today, especially for us as American Muslims, we need to understand the significance of this act. This is consent of the governed. The Prophet, peace be upon him, showing that in action. He is the Prophet. He is the leader of the community. He is receiving revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and yet he does not decide unilaterally for the community. He seeks their consensus, and when they say no, then it is no. And this is consent of the governed. This is the right of the people over their ruler. And that is why when the Quran says, Amruhum shura baynahum, that their matters are decided by mutual consultation, here it is. And that's why the companions named that surah, Surah to shura because they realize the significance of this principle. And when we live in a nation where half the people say that a Muslim should not be appointed to the Supreme Court because we don't understand the principles of constitutional government, here are the principles of constitutional government that a thousand years after Islam came up with this and civilized humanity, a thousand years later, Europe was still in the throes of the philosophy of divine right of kings to rule and that their word is the law without contestation. And yet a thousand years before that, the Prophet, peace be upon him, was giving humanity a very, very different model, a model that, alhamdulillah, some nations have finally arrived at and unfortunately, our nations have forgotten about. But today is the first of the last 10. And it is the time for us to remember these principles. It is the time for us to remember the caliber of the faith in which we believe and the allegiance which it deserves. And the reason that we lavish our love and our praise and our prayers on the Prophet, peace be upon him, not just because he received the revelation, but because of the character of the man that he was. And it's time for us to understand that we need to change the way we study and teach and learn the seerah of the Prophet. Everyone knows the story of the pigeon and, and, and the spider spinning a web and laying eggs on, on the mouth of the cave when the Prophet was in Hijra. But very few people know this story. And that story about the pigeon and, and the spider, God knows best, but the vast majority of the scholars of hadith consider it a very weak narration. And many Sira books won't include it because it is so weak. God knows best its truth or not. But this is the stuff that has the moral and the philosophical value. And if we're going to teach our kids and teach ourselves, 
this is what we need to be studying and learning and teaching and teaching others about Islam. And I say what I've said, I ask Allah to forgive me and to forgive you. May Allah accept from all of us.